The Holy Gospel for the day is taken from the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray for the presence of the Spirit. Come, Holy One, and settle over us. Grant the blessing of your spirit, Lord, that these words would be your words to us and that your presence and your word would shape our lives. Amen. The very largest mass of any living thing on the planet Earth is General Sherman. General Sherman is a sequoia tree in the Sequoia National Park. It's 275 feet tall. It's 102 feet around at its base. It's thought to have been living for 2,200 years, so before the time of Christ. And it weighs an estimated 2,756 ton. It's a very big tree. The really interesting thing about this very big tree is that sequoia seed are about the size of an oak, um, uh, an oat, no, an oat, a little piece of oat flake. And um, it's estimated that the sequoia seed weighs less than one six thousandth of an ounce. Very great things often come, often start very small. Before becoming president, James Garfield was the president of Hiram College in Ohio. One time he was in his office and this man came in and asked how he might help his son to get through college in less than the four prescribed years. Is that possible, he said, and Garfield said, yes, of course it's possible. It depends on what you want your son to do. When God makes an oak tree, it takes 100 years. When God makes a squash, it takes two months. Good things often take time. You know, if you look at the kingdom of God, the teachings in the scripture about the kingdom of God remind us that both of those things are true. That sometimes the greatest of things begin small, and that that which is good often takes a long time to develop. So if what you're doing as your role in the kingdom of God seems too small to matter, or it doesn't seem to be changing anything, then just hang on, because God is the one at work here, and will do what God desires to have done with what you are doing. Marva Dawn is a contemporary religious um, thinker and author, and she writes in her book that when you look at Jesus, you discover that he never talks about the kingdom of God from the perspective that God loves us, but rather from the perspective that the kingdom of God is about God being ruler of our life. That Jesus' agenda in his teaching about kingdom of God is to turn your life over and let God rule in your life. Now that's a countercultural idea if you think about it, because the reality is that we live in a world where most of us don't really want somebody telling us what to do. We don't really want to have someone controlling our life. And so this is kind of a difficult message to hear from Jesus. But on the other hand, if you really look at your life and you look at the lives of the world around you, I think you'll 
you'll discover that the life that's lived under Christ is a life that has purpose and meaning in a way that it just can't happen apart from that. If you look carefully at what Jesus teaches about the kingdom of God in the scripture, you begin to get this image of something that's very different than what our world would expect and that what the world of his day would expect. So, for example, the people at the time of Jesus were expecting that the kingdom of God would be the coming of a Messiah who would overthrow the Roman government. And when that happened, would establish a new Jewish state, much like what had been present at the time of David. But that's not Jesus' agenda. In fact, it's said that every mother at the time in Palestine, particularly in the northern part of Palestine where Galilee is, where it's a little more restless and a little bit more exposure to the Romans, it's said that every mother dreamed that one day her child would grow up and be the Messiah that would deliver people from Rome. But Jesus isn't talking like that about the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't have that as an agenda. His agenda is not to become a rival to Rome. His agenda is not to become the kind of sort of nationalistic government that has the seal of approval from God on it. Jesus talks about the kingdom of God as where God rules and where it is God's will that you listen to and live in and gets changed. It changes your life. So if we look even at today's text, we find two participations in the kingdom of God, what it means, what it looks like to be a part of the kingdom of God. All throughout the scripture, this is expanded, but today we get two pieces of it. The first is that the kingdom of God is like a seed that someone plants and then they just go on about their life and do their stuff that they're doing and all of a sudden they realize that that's grown up into a full-grown plant and they don't know how that happened. Well, think about it. You know, what that's saying to us is that God is at work. What Jesus is really trying to get us to understand here is that God is busy doing what God does. That plant grows on its own. And what we're doing to it doesn't necessarily make it go faster or slower, but we're there to plant and to harvest. That plant just knows what to do on its own. Our sort of input is not so needed in what God is doing. That's one image for it, and I think that reminds us to be patient. Because sometimes we can't always see what it is that God is doing. So be patient. Do your planting. Watch and pray and listen and be ready when the harvest comes. But You know, it's not for you to know exactly how that will develop. And a lot of us know that we will never know in this lifetime who was influenced by our witness. We're going to have to wait to meet up with them in heaven for them to say, you know, you said such and such, and that really changed my life. (coughs) The second piece of this teaching today is that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which everyone at that time knew was the smallest seed in the world. Of course, it was in that area of the world. They just didn't know there were other parts of the world to be considered. But that smallest of seeds gets planted, and it grows into this large plant, which becomes shelter for many creatures. In this, Jesus is speaking sort of a cosmic word, that what God is doing is what protects and shelters and nurtures the whole of the universe, and that God knows just what needs to happen for that to happen. Reminds me a little bit of uh, General Sherman, you know, started tiny, grew large. Um, And we didn't determine that. And just imagine there's not one person alive who saw it both small and large. And there's not one person alive who did anything to affect its individual growth. Because that's what God is doing. And so it is in the kingdom of God. Now having said that, that doesn't mean that we can't nurture the plant along as it goes. And so we can. We do get invited to nurture that which has been planted. First, soil. We all know that the better the soil, the better the growth. If you don't know this already, you can come and visit my house and look at my backyard because the soil out there is mostly clay, which means that when it's dry, it's like cement. We one time rented one of those tillers an automatic tiller, you couldn't begin to break the ground with it. We had to use those big sledgehammers to get the ground open, picks, and then we could use the tiller. But when it's raining, that stuff is like glue. We one time had to dig in there after it had rained. We started looking like transformers, you know, with big glumps of glue on our dirty glue on our feet. 
That's the thing, you know, the better the soil, the better the growth. And so what did we do? We worked that soil. We brought in topsoil. We worked it some more. We aerated it. I think one of the very best things we did was bring in loads and loads of earthworms. Those guys really churn that soil up. And now we can grow a lawn on that place because the better the soil, the better the growth. And that's true in the kingdom of God also. If you're away from God, your heart is hard, and it makes it difficult for God to get through to you. And then when the difficult times come, you're willing to just cling to anything instead of turning to the one who can actually be a difference for you and can help you and make life better for you. That's what happens when you're away from God. But when you are near to God, when you are open to God, you're like a fertile place that God's word and God's desires and God's image just grows and grows until you become closer and closer to what God invited you and intended for you from the very beginning. Second, For a plant to be healthy, it has to have both water and sun. Not all rain and not all sun. And every plant is different. Have you ever noticed that? If you go to the desert, those are plants that want more sun and less rain. If you go to the tropics, those are plants that want more rain and less sun. God knows what is needed in each life. This is a countercultural idea once again because we live at a time and in a world that makes us think we should never have to suffer. We should never be uncomfortable. And we should never be inconvenienced. And I wonder sometimes what we are cheating ourselves out of by that attitude. Maybe we aren't leaving ourselves open to the place that God can most nurture us because no plant thrives at all it ever gets is sunshine. Over the course of my ministry, I've again and again asked people to describe when their faith grew the most. And inevitably, with only a couple of exceptions, people said as soon as they came through a hard time, they could look back and see how God had been with them. And the presence of God just grew and grew in them in that difficult time. The best evidence that I can give you for the idea that you want all sunshine being wrong, that's a wrong idea idea is the resurrection of Jesus, because you can't get to resurrection until you go through cross. It's rain and sunshine. It's going to come into every life. What matters is how you let it nurture your faith, how you let God in on both the celebration and the sorrow, how you let the Lord work in both of those times. That's what makes a difference. Third, it's okay to nurture the plant, to give it nutrients. The scripture names a bunch of different nutrients for us. There are things like Bible study and prayer and worship and service and giving and spiritual friendships and telling someone else the gospel. It is not a coincidence that those are the marks of discipleship. Jesus invites us into discipleship not so he can check our progress and figure out if we're doing enough and if we've done well enough for something. Jesus invites us into discipleship because doing those things grows our closeness with the Lord. If your faith is suffering and you feel like you're on a plateau and nothing is changing and you're not growing closer to the Lord, then find some discipleship things to do and you will find in short time your faith will be stronger and you'll be more and more receptive to what the Lord is doing because Jesus promised when you follow me, which means when you are my disciple, your faith will grow and it'll serve you, and it'll always be enough for whatever it is that you're facing. And finally, we need to stop trying to tell God what kind of plant it should be. You know, we got to stop saying to God, I don't want that plant, I want some other plant. And how tempted we are to always be the one who dictates what kind of plant it should be. You know, what if we're desert community? We don't want tropical plant. God knows what should happen here, what should happen in your life, and what should happen in the life of this congregation. And if we just let God be at work, that will happen. we got to stop trying to dictate to God what we should look like. We don't need to ask the question, what do I want? We need to ask the question, Lord, what do you want of me? Around the turn of the last century, right around 1900, A pastor by the name of Russell Conwell came up to his small church 
one morning, and he noticed a little girl out front of the church crying. He asked her why she was crying, and she said she wanted to go to Sunday school, but she went in, and they told her they didn't have room for her. He looked at her. She was very shabbily dressed, and he figured he knew the real reason why she hadn't been found room. So he took her by the hand, took her into the Sunday school class, got her a seat. She was so happy. She was so delighted. She was just overjoyed at being able to go to Sunday school. In fact, that's all she could think about for days. And then she began to think, I wonder how we could make our church bigger so that there'd be more room for other children to go to Sunday school. It just so happens that this little girl died two years later. When they came to move her body, they discovered under her body a beat-up red purse. It looked like she'd gotten it out of the trash. It was just really falling apart. Inside the purse was 57 cents and a note in her handwriting which read, This is to help us build a bigger church so more children can go to Sunday school. Pastor Conwell was so moved by what she had said in her note that he carried that beat-up purse and that 57 cents up to the pulpit, and he told her story, her story of faith and commitment, and then he invited the deacons of that church to get to work to figure out how they could expand this church so that more children would be invited to know the Lord Jesus Christ. A newspaper picked up the story. It got spread all over soon. Money began to come in from all quarters. Before long, they had $250,000. A realtor who was very wealthy saw it in the newspaper. He called or came to them and said he wanted to um, sell them some land. They said, we don't have money for land. He said, I'll sell it to you for 57 cents. If you want to see the outcome of that little girl's 57 cents, next time you go to Philadelphia, stop by Temple Baptist Church with its 3,300 seating capacity. And while you're there, don't forget to stop at Temple University where many young people have been educated over the years. And don't miss Good Samaritan Hospital that came from that. And don't miss that big Sunday school which houses hundreds of kids every Sunday. And in one of those Sunday school rooms, you will find a sweet-faced picture of that little girl. And hanging beside her picture is a portrait of Reverend Conwell. Isn't it amazing what God can do with a little girl, a faithful follower, and 57 cents? I wonder, from now, what people will say God did with you and Gloria Day. In your bulletin is the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to stand and proclaim your faith using those words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator.